you're building a web application and you need to run it somewhere. Why would you ever want to use this big complex Kubernetes thing? First off, in many situations you don't need Kubernetes, but before you make that decision, it's useful to take a few steps back and understand the problems that Kubernetes or any workload orchestrator is meant to address. In this video, I'm going to go back in time and describe the evolution of web application deployment over the past two decades to help you understand why workload orchestration systems like Kubernetes even exist. Without further ado, let's get into it. Let's roll the clock back 20 years or so to the year 2004. Shrek 2 was just released, Usher is in the club like yeah! and there's no clouds in sight. Remember, AWS didn't start until 2006. If we want to deploy applications, we need to have access to servers, oftentimes as the admin or root account. Now we've all seen the social network with Zuck and friends setting up computers in their closet and serving the initial versions of Facebook directly over the Harvard campus network. While this is a bit dramatized, the struggle is real. You might have managed the hardware yourself, or you might have rented it from someone else in a co-location facility. Either way, the process of provisioning and configuring servers was not easy. The tooling to manage large fleets of servers and the applications running on them simply didn't exist, and generally companies would employ teams of sysadmins to manage those machines. Because of these challenges, we're incentivized to keep the number of servers minimal and the systems deployed to them as simple as possible. Also, the fact that your applications were often running directly on the host meant it was very hard to manage any dependency conflicts across applications. These factors meant that monolithic architectures ruled the day. You loaded your entire application as a single artifact onto one or few big servers, put your database on one or more additional machines, and you're off to the races. We likely needed to roll our own monitoring tools in the form of some homegrown bash script sprawled across the fleet of machines. Also, because doing zero downtime deployments was so difficult, many apps would have scheduled maintenance windows to perform updates and roll out new versions. If we roll the clock forward a few years to 2010, Avatar and the era of 3D movies had arrived, Kesha's TikTok was playing on the radio, and the clouds have started to emerge, as well as configuration management tooling like Puppet and Chef. In the early days of the cloud, the offerings were limited, but the idea of creating and destroying virtual machines in a matter of minutes via an API was a paradigm shift. Also, the isolation that virtualization provides helped alleviate the issue of conflicting dependencies that we saw before. Now, rather than interacting with individual machines to install and update dependencies, we can build all of that right into the image that our virtual machine is provisioned from and swap out old instances with fresh new ones behind a load balancer, or even add and subtract replicas based on demand with autoscaling groups. If the monolithic applications from the 2000s were no longer working for us, usually due to organizational challenges of having so many different engineers trying to make potentially conflicting changes to the same code base, then the improved tooling of the cloud helped us to start carving our applications up into smaller pieces. That being said, generally a single or a small number of related applications would be run on each virtual machine. If the resource requirements of that workload were well known, this wasn't too much of an issue because we could manually decide the type of machines that would be an effective strategy for distributing the load across a fleet of instances. If resource usage was less well-defined, this could be a real challenge. Because the size and complexity of our platform is larger, we now need improved tooling to automate the deployment of new versions. We're gonna to need to monitor application health across all these machines, aggregate the logs and metrics from all the different copies of our applications, etc. Now, wouldn't it be great if we didn't have to think so much about the individual servers and choosing the right one for each workload? What if instead we could take a whole bunch of virtual machines and let the system decide how to schedule applications onto them? Great. We've effectively just described a workload orchestrator, and Kubernetes is the most popular one today. It's now time to roll forward to present day. Those ideas and challenges brought up from before have started to coalesce into the concept of a workload orchestrator. A number of these types of tools have emerged, and some have already even faded away, with themes like Docker Storm, Apache Mesos, HashiCorp Nomad, and today's industry darling, Kubernetes. These systems provide APIs that allow us to abstract away the individual machines and instead treat a cluster of instances as a single resource. We provide information about the type of resources that our workloads require and then let the system decide how to schedule and run them. Kubernetes, for example, 
also provides utilities and standard interfaces to enable third-party plugins to address all those concerns we deemed were necessary. Things like automated health checks to restart your application if it ever crashes, deployment strategies to handle rolling out new versions, and utilities to enable rollbacks if it's needed, auto-scaling of applications based on different metrics, and standard interfaces to can interact and configure things like networking, storage, and runtimes for all of your different workloads. Now, before the orchestrators were available, large mature companies were building these systems internally for themselves. But luckily for us, now some of those systems are available for public use. In the case of Kubernetes, Google decided to take many of the ideas from their internal orchestration platform Borg and release it as the open source project Kubernetes. Now, rather than provisioning a bunch of individual instances or auto-scaling groups for each application, we can provision a cluster and deploy many heterogeneous workloads onto it, leveraging the well-tested utilities of the system to take care of things that we used to handle with our homegrown script. So yes, Kubernetes is quite complex, but that's because it's trying to solve a very complex problem. Hopefully, this brief look over the past two decades has helped give you an appreciation for why Kubernetes exists and why it operates the way it does. Depending on the size and scale of your organization and applications, it may or may not be a good fit for you. In fact, I released an entire video for that topic, which I'll link to over there. That being said, if you do have many different applications and are operating them at scale, incorporating Kubernetes into your application platform can provide an amazing starting point. Remember, Kubernetes is not the end game. It provides many foundational building blocks to make deploying, scaling, and operating your applications easier but likely you're going to be building on top of Kubernetes to define the exact system that your organization needs. That's it for today. Remember, just keep building.